Hello everyone, and welcome to the Health Go Live webinar series. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Chime. Just a few housekeeping items to go over. We would like to remind everyone that the Q&A feature will be available, so feel free to send in those questions for the panelists throughout the discussion. And with that, I will throw it over to our moderator who joins us from LK, Mark Probst. Thanks, Eddie. We appreciate all of you being here today and, and joining us. We look forward to a robust discussion with, uh, well, for me, this is a, just a personal pleasure because these are my friends and peers and uh, people I look up to in the industry. So I'm really honored to be here with this uh, fine group of CIOs, but also really honored that many of you would join us today uh, on this particular discussion. Um, and we're looking at the you know, health systems and their health as we look getting out of this pandemic. I don't know for each of you, you're all in different parts of the country, but uh, here in Utah, where I live, uh, things are starting to look pretty good. Mask mandates gone. Uh, we have got uh, not the majority, but an awful lot of the population is now vaccinated and uh, it doesn't feel normal, but it feels better than it did. Let me introduce and, and have them give a brief introduction of themselves, uh, my friends that are on this particular panel. And I'm just going to do it the way it shows on my screen. So Tanya Townsend, Tanya is the CIO, SVP and CIO at LCMC Health. And uh, Tanya, why don't you just give a brief introduction? Sure. Thanks, Mark. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. I'm Tanya Townsend, uh, Chief Information Officer for Louisiana Children's Medical Center based in New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, we are a six hospital system throughout the community of New Orleans. And we um, grew up uh, independently, but now we formed a new enterprise and we range from everything from focused and dedicated to children's with Children's Hospital of New Orleans, all the way to a large uh, trauma level one center, academic medical center in uh, University Medical Center of New Orleans. And we've got just about every service scope and size in between. So that's a little bit about who we are. Well, thank you, Tanya. And it's wonderful to have you on the panel. Next up is Randy Gab Gabor. Or, I, it's I know I, it's, 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 always, it's the trickiest name, and Mark, you've always done a, a great job at trying to figure those out and uh, get it right. So, Randy Gaborio, uh, Chief Digital and Information Officer for Christiana Care. Uh, we are a we're a provider system, like my colleagues here. Um, we are serving sort of four state region here uh, on the East Coast, headquartered in Delaware, serving Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, and Delaware. Uh, and like Tanya, and like we're an academic uh, platform uh, as well. So looking forward to uh, some great insights today. Thank you, Randy. And you know, you know, Tanya, you don't know this about me, but I actually was the director of IT at Tulane when I was probably your age. Uh, many, many years ago, but, uh, and then Randy, um, you probably don't know this is either, but I'm on the board in the Morris Children's Hospital, which work very closely with Christiana. So Absolutely. yeah, wonderful to be with you. Finally, my friend Zafar Chaudhry, uh, Zafar is up at Seattle Children's. He's this SVP and CIO. Zafar. Thank you, Mark. Thank you everyone for joining the the discussion today. So Zafar Chowdhury, I'm a Senior Vice President, Chief Digital and Information Officer at Seattle Children's. Seattle Children's is a pediatric health system. We, we service Washington, Alaska, Montana, and Idaho. We have 46 sites and we're into hope, care, and cure for kids. Yeah, and Zafar, for, you know, you and I have some relationships in the past because at Intermountain we had primary children's. And uh, there was several, you know, things that were going on between the two organizations. So what a pleasure to be with all of you today. And for those of you who are just joining, um, we would love for you to ask questions. We will try to get to many, as many of those as we can. But let's go ahead and jump right into it. So um, let's start with Tanya. Tanya, what does healthcare delivery look like in late 2021 and going into 2022? I know it's a broad, huge question, but if we're going to Put some context around our discussion. What do you think it looks like? Yeah, excellent question. And I think we could probably spend the whole hour on it. So uh, I'll throw out some ideas and look for my colleagues to, to chime in. But 
Um, I think what the pandemic showed us is um, we certainly need to continue to be agile and flexible. I think we need to shift our focus to being more consumer driven. I think our industry has been a little bit behind that concept of really realizing the patient is, is our consumer and we need to be flexible with their needs, whether that's adjusting how we deliver care through telemedicine, um, keeping them healthy outside of our walls, um, changing our hours of operation, I think patient access, just having um, a lot more avenues to receive care and really focusing from a technology perspective on how we do that. So the, the notion of the digital front door is going to continue to be very important in this post pandemic world. Um, the patient experience and quality also going to continue to be something that we must focus on as we move from volume-based care to more value-based care. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll kind of let my, my colleagues chime in here, but the other thing I would just mention that I think came to light during COVID was the social determinants of health. Um, that certainly is something I think we've all been aware of, but it became even more heightened with, again, really understanding access and how we deliver care to our communities and understanding that there are variances um, based on that social determinant aspect. So anyone else want to chime in on that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll throw in. I think that more, I mean, that's the end of 2021 is really not that far away. But I think it's going to signal this. Uh, it's going to be beginning at the beginning of this, sort of this tectonic shift of care in the home and equity around uh, with communities and like. And so for us, we we have sort of our north stars that uh, that we've laid out, which are the focusing on all care that can be digital will be digital, and all care that can be in the home will be in the home. And that's framed around the sort of this digital continuous and in the home thought. This is going to be the real launch pad. Because with COVID, organizations had to sort of adapt and figure out how do you actually begin to care for people at a distance uh, that one, in some cases, um, can't leave their home, can't come to our facilities even uh, in those scenarios. So I think this is this sort of, it rewired the mindset of care delivery institutions that, uh, that, that digital needs to lead. Uh, and then it's, it's supported by sort of these other capabilities uh, that we talked about, and then bringing obviously the ability of closing the gap around equitable healthcare and the way that we build, deliver, and that includes the digital side, because there are uh, there is a digital divide as well as there is on things like incredible. And you know, in our community, Mark, as you know, you know there is a three mile distance and a twelve year death gap uh, that exists uh, amongst communities. So it's going to be about building and understanding that now that experience has become the organizing principle for healthcare. Um, and it's really gonna be around, as Tanya said, really the, the consumer uh, sort of drives decisions. So the power base really shifts from the supply side of healthcare to the demand side of healthcare. So I'll leave it at that and let those of our chime in. Yeah, so certainly in pediatrics, similar trend, providing care in the community versus at the hospital itself, the hospital becomes we see the hospital becoming the destination center for care, specialty care versus community-based care across all of our sites. One of the things we have learned during this pandemic is that there is still a inequity gap around people's access to technology. So when we have parents and patients who don't have the right equipment at home, don't have Wi-Fi access at home, and that will cause some difficulty in, in this, this shift of model two care close to home. We need to work with our tech partners and together to find ways and how we can provide equipment to solve some of those issues. But yes, absolutely, you're gonna see that shift in care. Now there are, we've also found that certain specialties suit this telemedicine model better than others, right? So if you are doing telepsychiatry, that works really well in the telemedicine space. But if you're trying to, look at a patient or see a patient for, for a surgical procedure, yeah, you can do the, the initial consults, but at some point they're actually gonna to have to use a, a facility, a surgery center or a hospital to get that care. So that's what we've seen in the pediatric space. So far, uh, I'm sorry, Mark, I was gonna- No, no, bad, Randy. Bad, Randy. I mean, that, that, that concept like in the, in the great framing, 
such that everything that we can do digitally first with a population, we want to do that and then pull them across the physical threshold when we make the determination either you know by the caregiver through AI or some other form factor or through a telemedicine visit where they say, I don't like the sound of the cough. We do need to lay hands on you. What will be amazing in that sense is that we're pulling people and we're getting access for the right people instead of having sort of people you know, crossing the threshold on their own, we're defining who needs to come in when and then, then provision the resources. So that begins, Mark, let me just sort of one other piece, is this beginning to sort of think about how do you begin to match demand and capacity, which is something that healthcare has not been really great at doing, uh, as we can see regarding the concept of access issues that thread through all of our organizations. Uh, I, I think, I mean, this has been so far really good and I love your comments. Um, one of the things I was thinking about is, and, and it's a little more in the minutia, maybe, but it's at a very, I just think there's gonna be increasing pressure on payment. That, that, you know, just given the economics of what surrounded the pandemic and what it's done to our organizations, your organization specifically, there's going to be this increasing pressure. Now, many of the strategies we just talked about can help uh, in dealing with that. Um, but I think there's going to be a lot of pressure there. The other thing I was going to say, Randy, and you brought it up in your comment, or brought it to my mind, is when we went into the pandemic, <clears throat> we went to it in a reaction of what we had to do. And I think we're still, many organizations are sustaining that reaction. We needed to do telemedicine. We needed to do digital. I think going into 2022, if we're not really focused on now, what's our strategy? And, and you guys mentioned that, so I know you're thinking about it, but explicitly, what is going to be our strategy for using digital and, and improving access and those kind of things? We're probably gonna miss the mark and, and we gotta work with our organizations closely to, to develop those strategies. Yeah, and I, I think um, Zafar touched on it too, but, but really understanding how do we partner with the tech world on, um, building these digital strategies that maybe haven't been invented yet and continue to be innovative. So how do we, exactly as uh, Randy said, how do we make sure that we can provide whatever we can provide in that virtual environment? So whether that's education or FDA approved devices that can automatically feed our EHR, you know, how do we continue to partner and develop those um, technologies? It's gonna, it's gonna make for a really, interesting and new dynamic for those of us in technology and healthcare, and I think our organizations overall. As you were talking, I was thinking, and maybe I'll start with you, Zafar, data. How, how does data play into that new world where, you know, not necessarily new world, but the changing world that we're going to go into toward the end of this year and, you know, for the foreseeable future? Well, I think there's two components to it. One is the the interchange of data that we've been trying to do, the interoperability for so many years between organizations. And you start to see some of that traction happening with the change in EMRs and people being more open to sharing information. And at the same time, the patient access to their own information. So certainly during this pandemic, we did a, a Cerner to Epic migration and at the same time turned on open notes for our patients. and that's been pretty well received. And when we're now interchanging data between facilities, we, we've, we've shared more data than we ever have been able to do through the old model of faxing records across to people. So I think that's definitely going to, to, to improve moving forwards, but it works both ways. How do we help the patients have access to the data? How do we uh, share the data, the relevant data with organizations? But the other thing to think about in all of this is, well, what about the clinicians themselves? So- Girl, do our role? We are asking our clinicians to do more and more with less and less time, right? So how are we gonna change their workload to do all of this, looking at records coming in, doing telehealth visits, doing outpatient physical visits, Hi. and then actually performing surgery? Okay. Yeah, I, I think um, what we were also able to leverage during the pandemic is exactly like Safar said, how are we now able to exchange information, make that a little more 
uh, doable and how do we take that and research it? So we were able here in Louisiana, we were able to research what was happening in New York because we had that ability to now um, de-identify the PHI of the information, but share um, in some databases and, and, and things like that and understand and research what was happening and be proactive about it. And then same thing, once we were kind of the hotbed, we were able to share our techniques and our learnings with the rest of the world too. So it was, it really came um, in handy and it was something that probably 10 years ago, there's no way we could have done uh, without some of our EHRs coming together, things like interoperability coming together and um, making those requirements to have more open notes and, and open exchange of information. I'll say data is gonna completely redefine this entire sector along with many other sectors of industry. Um, and it's the single largest lever that we have in order to actually sort of change, change care, change the experience. And we can't scale care, the model we have in an analog fashion. It has to be through data and it has to be through digital technology to do that work. And so Mark sort of leaning into a little bit of sort of how this connects back to even to your last question. Like so, so part of this is like this journey to resilience for healthcare um, is, you know, as you think about kind of the strategy and how data fits in, we effectively took our strategy once COVID hit and basically held it over a shredder and dropped it in and said, okay, there's the world we've been living in, which is before COVID. There is that BC, there is the DC, the during COVID world, and then there's AC after COVID. And AC after COVID will not be and will not look like before COVID. It will be a very different world that incorporates those learnings that includes digital and most incredibly, how we leverage and deploy data. But it can't be simply like, oh my goodness, the number of data lakes that we've deployed, it has to be around how are we actually exploiting that data to drive the real transformational work in terms of how we orchestrate care in a different, in a different model using all the tools that can be layered on top of data. So can we, can we get there incrementally or is this much more deliberate than maybe we've been thinking? I think there's a, an incredible sort of an inertia now. And I think that um, at the same time, as, as, as almost as a first market mover does that, other organizations have to follow because they can't afford to leave that value on the table. So you're going to have to optimize all those processes and be able to lean in. To, uh, you, you just won't be able to. And if you look at it from the old value or the, this, the current structure of payment models, you're, you're, the, the payer structures are not gonna allow any value to be left on the table. It's going to have to be captured uh, and do that because the margins are just too constrained and we're facing margin compression as an industry. So the road to resilience also goes through, uh, you know, through value-based care in order to do that, to, to strive towards a model of how do you move towards pro, you know, prospective payment to be resilient? Because we all ran into sort of challenges as an industry around liquidity uh, concerns as, as, uh, as all those elective procedures were deferred. Sounds like we're going to have to have some courage. I mean, th this is not going to be for the faint of heart, right? Well, there's probably there's probably two folks: those that are faint of heart and those that will survive. <laughs> How about our other panelists? Any thoughts on what we're talking about here? Yeah, I completely I completely agree with the whole. You know, who's going to be left standing at the end of this as we come to? as Randy put it, you know, after COVID. And there's also some resilience pieces that we need to think about, not only with us in IT and our teams and how they've fared through all of this, with not knowing when work starts, ends, and, and all of those things. There's certainly, I've seen lots of mental health issues just in internal teams, but also with the clinicians and the burnout that has been faced with, uh, actually handling this you know, terrible disease. And so the healing that components of coming out of COVID will yes, include a technology component for sure, but at the same time, what are organizations going to do to get their staff through to the AC side of this, this sort of journey, right? And I don't think we've really looked at that yet, but I'm certainly in my own team seeing that as be being a challenge to coming back to the office in this some sort of hybrid fashion. Tanya, anything? 
Yeah, I guess we're kind of blending topics a little bit, but um, we can get into the whole uh, remote workforce and what that's going to look like. But I guess just touching on, you know, learnings from the pandemic, I would say let's not lose traction. Um, completely agree with Zafar on uh, mental health and, and just trying to manage our, our new world. But we picked up the pace so um, amazingly well, both from the technology front, but also just the adoption. So I don't, I'm sure you probably have similar stories, but we were dabbling with telemedicine a little bit before COVID hit. I think we maybe had like a dozen or so visits <laughs> over the course of a couple months. And so we were really trying to get the adoption ready to go. And um, just, you know, everything had to be perfect before we hit the button to turn it on. So then when COVID hit, we didn't have that luxury to sit and wait and perfect. It was we're turning this on and it went through the roof. I think we went from those dozen visits to 25,000 visits within 30 days. Um, so I would say both from the technology front, as well as partnering with our organizations from an operational and clinical standpoint, let's not lose that momentum. Let's continue to be flexible, agile, and continue to take those lessons we learned on keeping that pace moving. Well, so you brought it up. If we think about our teams, and all of you manage very large teams, um, it's going to be different post pandemic. It's different today. It's way different today because of some of the things that we've done. But what, what do you think? How, how does life change AC? Randy, we're going to start using your terminology. AC for these teams and for the, the associates that work with us. Well, this is interesting, Mark, because you think like, right, as was it, March 11th or 13th, when, when, when sort of COVID declared and, you know, the world changed, we basically, we, we, we formulated, right, sort of this, this virtualized, diffused, remote workforce. But the observation I made is that that workforce already had sort of cemented relationships. They had established methods for working together. They knew who kind of were your, you know, who I went to on this team and how to, how to work together in such a way. So that was in sort of intact and went virtual. The worry that I have, you know, in addition to, some of the points that Zafar has made is that the ability to sort of onboard and bring new people in and do sort of the cultural work uh, is lost in a fully virtual world and is even harder to do um, under this approach. But so we're going to have to sort of face a sort of a hybrid, a hybrid model. But at the same time, we also look at it and say, wow, this ability to sort of, um, you know, we've unlocked the obstacles of a remote workforce, which means so your talent pool is broadly expanded. Um, but how do you then do that cultural work and create the connective tissue and the builder relationships and all those sorts of things that uh, the cultural norms, the, the things that we're going to have to figure out how to do that sort of work to build team structures. And I think you, I mean, I think you can build teams virtually, but there's a point at which um, having sort of that, that uh, you know, folks together working through a problem creates a, sort of this, you know, this, this work, this workforce like manner. That, uh, that, that needs to be there in order to sort of hit the, the, the sort of the sets of challenges that we face in healthcare. Yeah, completely agree. Um, so I think there's so many pros and cons, strengths, um, weaknesses, I guess, of, of both the approaches. Um, I do think here again, we were exploring the idea of having some remote. So we were doing, you know, maybe one day a week, we would do like some remote work. And then of course we had to immediately shift to go fully remote. And there were a lot of benefits that we were able to realize that um, without the pandemic, we might not have been able to really focus on, but we were able to keep up with productivity. We found new ways to measure performance. We found new ways to try to continue to have a culture, um, even if it's virtual. Uh, staff seemed to really appreciate it. Our, our employee satisfaction, our engagement scores were higher than they've ever been um, because they liked this new world of flexibility. However, on the flip side, completely agree with Randy that it's hard to keep and sustain a culture in that environment. It's hard to really build those relationships. It's hard to um, be able to do that virtually. And then you get back into that mental health concept too. And are people okay at home? Do they have the right tools at home? Do they have daycare, et cetera, to be able to truly perform their job? So I, I think it's going to be a, a hybrid world of how do we continue to be flexible, continue to perform, but also figure out what that culture looks like in our organizations. 
Yeah, I, I, I also agree. I think it's going to be a paradigm shift in engagement that needs to happen. Have we really learned all of that yet? No. Interesting enough, humans still need social interaction and maybe less so in tech because we're mostly intro introverts, but at the same time, it's pretty eye-opening when you do come into the office and people smile when they actually see faces versus these faces that we see on Zoom calls and WebEx calls. So I think there is some cultural work to be done, certainly in our organization and others, into well, what does that hybrid virtual type, non-virtual type engagement look like? And I'm not sure we're really specialists in that space, so we're probably going to need some help. You know, when you look at some tech companies, they've been doing this a lot longer than us. They have, do, do have permanent work from home people. And so we maybe partner and learn about how that new model looks like. And I think that's the shift that needs to happen. Yeah, I, and I, and I have some concerns around security, obviously. I mean, there's technology to do it, but there's still a concern out there. Um, but you can't stop people from writing things down or taking pictures of their screens and you know some of the issues that go on there. I don't think we fully understand liability. And it's something, again, these are all hurdles we can get over, but they're things that I think we need to pay attention to. But let me, let me broaden this, not broaden, let me talk about this question just a little bit, because as you were speaking, I was thinking about it. You know, if, if we're seeing productivity, which I still also question, but if we're seeing productivity at the levels or better than we were when we had a, a workforce that was with us, and, and so we don't have to have them right there, what does this do around the question of outsourcing, right? I mean, because part of, you know, that, that's, there's definitely other industries that are, are, are playing in that space. What do we think about that in a AC world? Yeah, I was, I was gonna mention that one too. The um, remote workforce definitely opened up our recruiting strategies. So no longer were we recruiting within our you know, small radius of mileage, we did open that up. So I completely agree is it's, it's going to continue to ask the question you're asking, Mark, of um, how do we share resources potentially across industries or across organizations if they really can be available from anywhere? Um, great question. I, I think we will have to learn from others. Mark, I think, I think you broadly to talk about outsourcing, I think is what you were teeing up as your, as your question there. I think, I mean, outsourcing pre or post pandemic, right, it was sort of part, part of a, you know, a, a strategy in terms of things. And I think of it like you can still employ strategies, things around um, as you look at the life cycle of, of any given sort of solution system or platform. And as those things kind of reach their peak and they sort of age and are facing retirement, you know, so I look at it more strategically and think from the standpoint of those things that are no longer the sort of the strategic investments we're making that are kind of growing and feeding our strategy, supporting our strategy, and those ones that are supporting kind of the strategy that was, those become sort of the candidates for outsourcing. Now, mixing that in with a sort of the complexity of sort of the, the after COVID world, um, you know, um, I think you still need to have sort of a core, a core strategy of what's, what would be outsourced, why would it be outsourced, so that you can have sort of the, your, the, the people you're making investments in and training and growing their careers are working on the systems that are the most strategic um, around that work. You know, outsourcing can solve other problems, but you know, I always feel like outsourcing is about which set of problems do you want to deal with? <laughs> you can trade off, there, there's a set of management trade-offs, and outsourcing also can lead to, you know, anytime that there's scope change, uh, you know, the cash register begins to ring uh, and the like. So it, it becomes a different competency to run an outsourced organization than it is to necessarily grow and build your own talent base. So it's, it's, it's a management trade-off that may fit the strategy of an organization one way or the other. Yeah, and we, we at Children's have a hybrid strategy we already are using a large percentage of managed services versus in-house. We have expanded to take on staff in multiple states. It is a lot harder to manage staff in states that you don't have a presence in. We certainly learned that from the, from the pandemic. But yeah, I agree with Randy. Outsourcing completely changes the skill sets of your internal team. Vendor management is a skill that not everybody has. 
And absolutely, if you don't keep a, a keen eye on that outsourcer, the outsourcer will absolutely kill you with change control notices. So it's a completely different skill set, but it's a necessity. It depends on what services, as Randy said, what services do you want to have the headache of versus what you don't. We've sort of taken the approach of commodity IT services are the ones that are suitable for buying services from other people and keep the subject matter expertise in-house to sort of consume applications, run applications. So it's more of the, the hosting, the service desk, the data center type services, which are very easy to consume and measure and keep the control on costs versus, you know, if you were looking at clinical systems, you, you would want to keep that closer to your heart moving forwards. And, and what you just outlined so far, um, because those things are more easily measurable, maybe that gives us some hints on ways we can look at how we would measure the productivity of our teams as we go forward. Because I do think it's going to be, it's a new skill set for us, but it's a skill set we need to know as we, as we look at a more hybrid situation. Uh, and, and I grew up in professional services. I was a consultant with Deloitte. And kind of the tagline was never outsource your strategy. You know, so, and I think that's very consistent with what all three of you are saying. Okay, so as we look at uh, our organizations, what was deferred or delayed because of the pandemic? We all had plans going into it. Those plans obviously changed. So what was deferred or delayed? And when do you think those will be revisited, if ever? Um, I'll take a shot at it at first. And so I thought about this question and um, I, I really came up with nothing. <laughs> so we, we really did continue on our strategic priorities and we had to shift and pivot to do both, um, manage the pandemic and manage our strategy. If anything, it actually expedited a lot of our strategies because we already knew we were gonna be working on virtual care and um, cybersecurity and, and us, all of those types of things. So it really almost expedited the strategy. So nothing necessarily from that standpoint got deferred um, with the exception of, I'm sure all of you, well, we talked about it already, the experience of um, patients having to defer their care. So elective procedures canceled, um, folks afraid to come in for their immunizations, et cetera, the routine care. So that's what we're really focused on now is trying to bring our patients back safely, get our volumes back to where they need to be and or continue down the virtual care journey. Um, so I, I can't say we really sh shifted much of anything. And we already talked about this too, but the other piece that I would say maybe got deferred or adjusted is culture. Um, very difficult to shift and develop culture and do team building and things like that virtually. So that's the other piece we're going to be focusing on uh, redeveloping and, and understanding what post-pandemic culture looks like. Yeah, similar trend for us. We were, we were knee deep in a CERNA to epic migration, so we really couldn't slow that down. We're building a couple of towers to our facility. So I, I actually see people doing a lot more work in the pandemic, right? There was a lot of digital transformation, a lot of push to telemedicine and telehealth. What we did do more of though, was maybe look at our priority levels. And what we tried to do was say, well, those things need to go at full speed if they affect patient safety and some other things can be sort of put as a priority too. So we did certainly look at that, but. In terms of volume of work, we, yeah, I don't think people really slowed down from even talking to colleagues about this. And same story with us in terms of, you know, we, you know, we've deferred a couple of, maybe the, the addition of some capacity here and there, just because, uh, you know, leadership or managerial functions were focused on the intensity of the COVID work, such that that sort of, you know, recruiting and the, the recruiting processes and so forth, uh, just felt like they were low priority in the midst of the ambiguity of COVID uh, at the time. But as we've come through and we could see, you know, better days, then those things were reactivated. I, and I agree with what each of you are saying. I, and I was thinking, and, and we didn't, because when I was at Intermountain, I was thinking, you know, if we had a big ERP install, we probably would have put that aside. Uh, as we dealt with some of these very large projects that we had to deal with to, to support the pandemic and our people in the pandemic. 
but I, I agree. The work levels went way up. Um, you know, just the amount that people were willing to do and needing to do. I love the fact that the decision cycles got made so small. And Tanya, I think you referred to that earlier that, you know, decisions that would take us a year to make, we were making in a week and, and rolling things out. And you know what? We didn't make that many mistakes in that process. I mean, there's things we could have done better for sure, but it actually went really smoothly and really well. Any <laughs> other one? Sorry, I was going to say, Mark, on that front, like part of what happened you know, is, is that the organization had this singularity of purpose and it isn't no, normally like that. And as we come out of COVID, right, we kind of have to get back to it's not going to not everybody's going to have the singularity of purpose. There's different functions, different priorities, different components of the strategy. So we're still going to have to kind of recede that intensity and kind of go back to like, what does governance look like in the post pandemic world? Uh, is it the same? So, you know, in my view is I always say like governance is actually the best technology investment you'll make. And of course, right, there's, it's, it's a zero technology footprint uh, in, in governance. So that I think is going to be complex and have a, you know, a reckoning for organizations as the singularity of purpose fades. Any impact, any impact from your minds of IT as it relates to its positioning within the organization? I mean, you hit it with governance, Randy, but, but other aspects of IT or what we do as CIOs? Yeah, I, I think, um, not to be too selfishly speaking, but I think um, the pandemic, again, just shed light and, and gave us a lot of attention. I, I, I said this to my, my CEO, so we just went live on our EHR. We were still on paper at one of our hospitals two years ago. And had the pandemic hit two years ago, we would have been in a world of trouble to be able to react and respond as rapidly as we did on paper. So I just think it shed a lot of light on just about everything we did in response to COVID, used data, it used technology, it used our EHR. Um, so it, it just shed a lot of light on the importance and significance of technology and, and, and digital world and how do we continue to um, advance it and realize it really is an asset. It, it's a tool, it, the technology is a tool, it's an asset, it's a um, instigator of how we take care of patients. Yeah, and I think that, you know, pre-pandemic, IT had a seat at the table, and the pandemic has now given us the high chair at that same table, right? So people listen more. My biggest fear, though, and I'm sort of seeing bleed of this, is we've done this agile work, and we've made decisions much faster than the typical bureaucracy that you find in healthcare. But my big fear is I'm seeing trends of it moving backwards. So as things are opening up, people are becoming a lot more conservative again. And so my worry would be, are we going to go full circle? Are we going to go from learning a lot, becoming agile, making good decisions, pushing the digital agenda to, well, now everything's gone back to some sort of new normal. And now we're going to have death by committee to do everything. That would be my fear. Is that a good fear, Randy? Uh, well, this is, I mean, it ties right into that whole point of governance and uh, the ability to sustain a, a, you know, a governance model that can move at, at, you know, we'll call it at sort of market speed or faster than, how do you defy gravity and move faster than market speed? I think just a different angle on that question, Mark, is, this is interesting, is that as we think about all the components that it takes simply like, okay, you know, a patient sort of, you know, they have symptom, they go through the ambulatory visit, they come in, and then now they register. And you think about the registration process today, what function owns the registration process today? And so if the registration process broke, who's accountable today? But as we think about all those components being replaced with like digital registration or pre-registration and kiosks and on your phone and all these other things that we can do, when registration breaks, it's IT. So we're now actually becoming some of the process owners the functional business owners of additional capabilities as those things move from physical or analog to being digitally constructed, delivered, and supported. So the role of the CIO starts to push into a COO type function uh, around the, the, the digital operations platform of the organization. So I just think it's, and that, and that will continue and continue and build and build 
uh, therefore making our roles even more complex. See, I, I love what you're saying there because one of the things I've noticed through the pandemic, and again, we all had our jobs and we all had teams, we we're all managing big projects and those kind of things. But I, what I've noticed through the pandemic in my friend CIOs is just how knowledgeable the CIO is in the operation of the organization. And what I believe I've been seeing happen is the organizations recognizing that as well. And that's why that door opened, you know, your example around registration. Andy. But I've seen that in other, you know, I've seen CIOs that have picked up the pharmacy because they needed that kind of leadership and they proved that they understood it, not just the tech, but how that operation actually worked and how it could work better. So I think that's a pretty cool result or, or, or impact from the pandemic. But, you know, and so far you brought this up, the, the problem is, is we could revert back. What are you gonna do? What are you guys gonna do? Or what are we gonna do to not allow that to happen or at least to try and prevent that from happening? Well, I think that may be a loaded question, Mark, right? But the reality is, is we as CIOs do need to continue to maintain that seat at the table and advocate to be involved in not just technology, but business operations where we can best suit and, and provide advice. But it will come from us continuing to push. The question would be, with the last 15 months and the amount of work that CIOs have done, are CIOs tired? Are they burnt out? Can they continue the pace that we're going at to make sure that the organization continues to listen to us, continues to innovate, and move forwards? And, and that could be variable, right? Everybody's in this very different place uh, after 15 months of this journey, which I don't know when necessarily it will actually end. So Tanya, worn out? Yeah, I think um, excellent points by everyone. I guess um, one other thing I would add, I completely agree governance is going to be very important and completely agree that we as technologists really are process, becoming process owners. Sometimes we're the subject matter experts on business processes. So I would say as CIO, something we need to focus on is um, building our teams up like that. So we have a lot of years of experience and we, we've been in the business a while, but how do we um, foster a team of technology that takes that same mindset? So for, I'll just throw out this example, but in my governance structure, we have identified key performance indicators for every single function or service area. And so I've constantly call it, telling my team, we have to get out of IT. We need to understand the business. It's not just about keeping the lights on. It's how do we partner with governance and partner with our organization and operators to um, improve our processes. And sometimes that's technology. Sometimes it's education. Sometimes it's workflow. But how do we um, really foster that kind of environment? So Mark, we, we are often the convener uh, in this case, when there's a spark or a need for change, we as IT are a wide angle lens on the entire enterprise. And there's really very few functions that have a complete wide angle lens. Um, we are the ones that have to engineer solutions to life, um, you know, often in long complex sort of project cycles uh, to do that work. And, but given that, given those conditions, it also positions us to drive strategy to bring about sort of yeah, the innovations needed to accomplish what doesn't exist today. So I, th I think the role of the CIO uh, remains one of the most mission critical components to, to the organization. If you just walk around in anywhere in our enterprises, you see people doing two things. They're interacting with people or they're interacting with information. And that information is often brought to them through technology. So it just gives you a sort of sense. I'm always reminded of that when I go do our go sees uh, and what people are doing. And then, and then the key is how is that information fitting into workflow and, and adding value to the objective that they're targeting. So our roles are incredibly important and will, I, you know, I think for the horizon are going to just be more instrumental and key to the CEO. I, I totally agree, you know, and one of the things I think about is we can be victims of a situation. Oh, we got to put it into EMR. Okay, we got to get real busy and we're going to put our nose down and you know, become victims to that. Or we can become victims to a pandemic 
or we can be victims of coming out of a pandemic and there's going to be tremendous cost reductions that, you know, that are going to be required so that we can survive and move forward. And all of those things are valiant, right, that we're working on. It's going to be our attitude as we take it forward. Are we the victims here? Or are we really part of a team? And are we leaders in that team to take it forward? And just judging from the three of you, I see leaders. I see people that are taking this forward and taking a different perspective, not just, oh, these are all my technical problems, but no, these are the problems of the organization. Here's where I fit in that. Now I'm gonna help them solve that. So I'm, I'm pretty bullish on what the pandemic will do for the role of CIOs. And this is coming from a guy that probably 10 years ago was under the impression, you know, the CIO role is actually getting very, very technical because technology is getting so complex and we needed to be very technical. Uh, and I still think, by the way, we better be able to meet that need, whether we personally do it or we've hired the right people and, and manage them. But um, I, I do think there is, there is the potential for a new era for CIOs that's going to be very different than the one I grew up in. Nodding heads, so I guess that's good. Uh, on that. All right, let me change this just a tad. Let's talk about the government. And, you know, what's the government's role in healthcare or, or how do you see them participating in healthcare, you know, post pandemic and as we move out of this pandemic? And, and are those things going to be good or are they things we probably need to worry a little bit about? We always, you always need to worry no matter what. <laughs> That's just uh, par for the course. I mean, uh, Mark, just broadly, I see just an acceleration of payment models that are going to spark, spawn, seed, support, shift care from the four walls of our building, you know, into the lowest cost setting. Um, and that, you know, what, that's frankly the, the, the home. And we see that with CMS's work around hospital at home. Um, and so, you know, then the, the, the technology ecosystem that has to begin to fill in for us to be able to do you know, clinical grade work for the patient at the right stage of their care to be in the setting that can optimize their recovery or restoration to function. And that means part, part of like the seeding work is this thinking away from things like, oh, discharge to home to really start thinking about admission to home as the primary venue. And going back to like, let's just think what does it cost, you know, the last hospital or tower any of us have built or Zafar is currently building, like divide the number of bed, the price by the number of beds. And now think about, you know, somewhere between one and $4 million perhaps per bed. And now think about the deployment of that capital instead into building an ecosystem to care for these patients in the home setting. When we know that 81% of beds in American healthcare are filled with people suffering from comorbid complexities, associated with chronic conditions. So, you know, I think about this 1% at a time and utilizing, you know, the platforms that the government is setting forth to help us actually make the leap. Because when you make that leap, what happens is sort of first is sort of this, the assets over here that your business has been built on, suddenly the value proposition changes and there's a new set of assets that become sort of the generators of cash and regenerators of cash so you can reinvest uh, in, in new capabilities uh, to do that work. So, so I think you got to be smart, selective, and be bullish on the places that are going to fit the long-term sort of, sort of the notional thinking of where care is going to be delivered. And that it's going to be forced to be in the lowest cost setting if it can be in the lowest cost setting. Back to all care that can be in the home will be in the home, and all care that can be digital will be digital. Yeah, and um, you touched on it, but definitely need to work on con continuing the work on reimbursement. So um, we certainly need government's help to, which they did during COVID. We now have telemedicine reimbursement, but even that was difficult to understand what was and what wasn't going to be reimbursed by who. So we need to continue to work uh, on the government side to understand what Randy just said. Um, Zafar touched on it earlier too, but just access broadband access in rural areas and making sure that every the entire population has access through internet and tools and laptops, et cetera. So how do we um, ensure the government is part of that conversation for just access in a virtual world? 
Um, switching gears a little bit around interoperability, and I'm, I'm sure you're all aware, we do not have a patient identifier, a universal patient identifier. This has been a historical issue. It makes interoperability kind of very difficult. Um, so we really need to work with government, which they, there has been some bills hanging out there that we need to continue to push that over the finish line and not um, avoid needing the, the need for that. Um, and then lastly, of course, in this virtual world, cybersecurity. I know we all heightened up our act in this space, particularly as we move virtual and move to remote and remote workforce, but um, how those things are expensive. There, there's a lot of tools and a lot of criminals out there that are getting smarter and smarter. So how do we partner with the government on either incentives or grants or um, even be more punitive to those threats? Those are some of my thoughts on govern government help. So I agree. I agree. The um, government is definitely going to drive us to do more for less. Absolutely. I think that government could do better in terms of giving us better communication in terms of what direction we should take. I also agree with Randy that, you know, care is pushed to the home. But one of our biggest gaps, certainly what we see in our health system is that social care component. So if we have a patient who, who can be discharged, sometimes we do not discharge the patient because they have nowhere to go. And the government needs to help us in building that care model. I mean, we can learn a lot. I mean, I've worked in so many different health systems across the world and most recently come here from the UK health system. And in the UK health system, there is a really good path to discharge. There is good social care. There is community nursing. So you can send somebody home and have follow-up. But what I see in our own system is we struggle with that, right? If, if, a, if a patient, a child doesn't have the right social setup at home, then sometimes we struggle to discharge that patient until we find agencies that can help us do that. And that sometimes takes time, which then can lead to things like bed blocking and other things. So I think we do need some government assistance in that space. Well, I agree. And, and my thoughts on this particular question were a little, uh, maybe a little more tainted than, than you all. Um, Tanya, you used the word government and help in the same sentence. And uh, I think that's an oxymoron, but uh, that just comes from years of being beat up by the federal government and the local government. Um, I love the patient ID, ID issue you brought up. You know, Chime wrote a wrote a bill, it wasn't a bill, but it was the outline for one. Uh, and we went and delivered that throughout DC. Um, maybe that'll get some traction someday because without a patient ID, all the things we're trying to do digital just become that much harder. And all the things we're trying to do with data become that much harder. But uh, I, I personally believe the government is going to become more invasive. They're going to become more involved in what we do in the delivery of healthcare. Um, mostly that's going to be driven by finances or the lack thereof of finances and the government's such a huge payer in what we do. So I see them becoming more invasive, more regulations, and just all the, co the cost pressures that are there. So uh, I love the outlook that, uh, that each of you put forward for what the government could do. And I think we have a role to play, um, you know, whether that's getting involved with Chime or getting involved with your local um, uh, advocacy organizations, but we, we have a role to play to help advocate for these things because we see the value the government can provide. Um, I'm just worried in this divided world that we have right now that we're going to see that kind of benefit. And actually, I think they're going to become more of a challenge for us over the next uh, several years. A anybody want to refute what I just said or uh, soften it? <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> All coherent points. Okay. Um, so how, how long do we forget the lessons of the pandemic? You know, how, how soon do we just kind of go back to business as normal and, and not remember some of the things we probably should have learned through this pandemic? I'm hopeful we don't, um, but as Avar mentioned earlier too, like, are we going to go all the way back to the overly bureaucratic processes that we've known? Hopefully we don't go all the way back that far. I hope that we continue to sustain this um, agility and continue to advance it. I think we're seeing pockets already, right? So if you look at this return to work, stay at home, work from home, 
We're in Seattle, we're seeing tech companies give conflicting messages to their staff. Come to the office, don't come to the office, come to the office three days a week. And we are doing, you know, I'm worried that we are starting to see some of that in our own health system where, you know, this July 1st date seems to be banded around about people come to work. I have a lot of people reach out to me in my own teams to say, does that mean it's going to be mandatory? Is it going to be a hybrid? I've been in healthcare such a long time from my physician days that I've seen this come full circle multiple times. I mean, we learn, then we don't learn, then we unlearn, and then we learn again. So I do have my, you know, apprehensions about will we go back to old school thinking? Andy? Uh, I th in the, in the, on the near term, on the horizon, you know, I, don't, I still feel like we're, we're still trying to reckon with what occurred, the, you know, the health systems broadly speaking, but I don't underestimate that there's pockets of hubris to want to reflex back to the norm of what they felt, what feels comfortable. And you know, our part of that job is to just fight against that reflexivity to go back uh, to the norm and just make sure that we're executing on, on the right things, on a strategy to basically advance care, impact care, reduce cost, and, through, and doing that through technology. Yeah, and, and my impression is we want to forget about this. And, and unfortunately, that's going to cause us to forget about some very important things that we've learned through it. But I, Tanya, I'm with you. I'm optimistic there are a few things that are going to stick that we learned and maybe we'll be a little more sanitary or I don't know, you know, uh, hopefully we get some lessons out of this. Okay, last question. I think I'm gonna go Randy, T Tanya and Zafar in that order. Uh, when's the first blockbuster hit come out about the pandemic? Okay, well, um, I would say 12 months after the, the WHO declares the pandemic having ended. Tanya? Yeah, I um, yeah, I, I would go with that too. I think they'll, there are going to be probably many blockbusters that get created on this and all competing with one another. But I personally am just excited for Disney movies to come back out. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm looking forward to. And Zafar? Yeah, I, I sort of concur with that time scale. Although I would argue that some of the movies on Netflix already predicted the pandemic and we've seen some of those. And uh, yeah, absolutely. I think you. The, the bigger question is who's going to star in these in these movies, right? That's that's the <laughs> question for the for me. Who's going to play Mark Probst? Who's going to play Mark? That's Mark right. Probst. <laughs> well, I could be almost any any person. <laughs> you guys, what a pleasure to spend the time with you. And I hope uh, the folks in the audience got uh, enjoyed the conversation. And I hope you all have a very safe and great uh, rest of the pandemic. And uh, we're going to see you AC, I hope, very soon. So thanks, everyone, and uh, enjoy your day. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.